Welcome to the February 2019 SCR Connections webinar. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'm so pleased to introduce today's speaker, Nina Daco. Nina has had a passion of working with insects ever since she was very young. She obtained her bachelor's in science degree in entomology from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2006 and a master's of science in environmental toxicology from Texas Tech University in 2011. She has studied mosquitoes and has been involved in mosquito surveillance and control activities in Illinois, California, and Texas since 2006. She is currently the Vector Control Supervisor in the Environmental Health Division at Tarrant County Public Health. Nina serves on multiple committees within the American Mosquito Control Association, namely the Chemical Subcommittee within the Legislature Legislative Committee and the Special Publication Subcommittee within the Publications Committee. She also serves as Second Vice President of the Texas Mosquito Control Association and the Chair of both the Media and Annual Meeting Programs Committees within this association. Her career goals include educating the public, government personnel, and elected officials about the importance of mosquito and vector control, building up mosquito and vector control programs, and furthering research within this field. She's going to be talking about some of those things today, and she's here here in the room with me at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Good morning, Nina. Good morning, Sarah, and good morning, all. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. You can, um, that, that was just, it was swell, so I don't need to say anything. Uh, I guess my only thing is to say is um, I am an entomologist, so if I seem to get really excited about bugs, it's because I really do love bugs. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm not going to, my goal is here not to read off of these slides for you, uh, but as far as it's outlined is concerned, I'm basically going to take you through uh, what a mosquito and vector control district is, what it does, why you get it, and then kind of through the eyes of Tarrant County Public Health, how we actually perform vector control activities. And of course, I'm going to throw in a bunch of fun mosquito facts and life cycles and great stuff that you may find not as interesting as I do, or maybe you will. Maybe you'll fall in love with mosquitoes after you watch this presentation. That would be really great. <laughs> All right, so first off, what is a vector control district? And more importantly, what is a vector? And so a vector in the terms that we're speaking are arthropods that cause diseases. And so um, there's a slew of insects and, and other arthropods like uh, ticks and spiders and mites and everything that's on the slide. But um, I'm going to point out that the bottom right-hand side um, is the one I'm going to be most focusing on. That's actually a picture of a female 80s Egypti mosquito, and so you'll hear a little bit about her as we go along. All right, so first off, a vector control district. What is it? It's a government entity. Um, it's usually an independent uh, district, meaning that there's tax funding that only goes to that district. It's not something that's uh, divvied out by um, a general fund. We, that's tax uh, revenue may vary, and that's by state. I gave a few examples up there of, of Texas, Florida, and California. So, for example, when we're talking about Texas, you see 0.25 per 100. What that actually means is the max amount that a district can possibly get is 25 cents per $100 of property tax. And that's actually uh, quite a lot of money. Uh, I think the goal there was Texas uh, actually has a lot of counties with not a lot of people, and so they might need more funding. If you're in a place like, for example, um, DFW area or Harris County, something like that, you would probably seek more of like 0 0.01 cents uh, or 0 0.01 one cent per $100 of property tax. Uh, usually there's a five-member committee that's uh, an advisory committee or a board of trustees that overlooks this special district. Those people are actually appointed uh, by commissioners or, or things of that sort. And then it's run by a mosquito engineer or director. That person is usually just someone who has a lot of experience and well-versed uh, to be able to run a district. All right, so I'm going to go through a few examples because they're all sorts of different types of, of mosquito control districts. Um, one example that I put up here is greater Los Angeles area. So if you were to look at Los Angeles County, this I, I believe is one of something like five districts within Los Angeles, and this uh, covers most of Los Angeles. So keep in mind that even though, let's say that you know this is the greater Los Angeles uh, mosquito control district, there may be other mosquito control districts only assigned to certain portions of that county. Um, the second example I uh, uh, placed up here is Metropolitan Mosquito Control District. This is actually um, in the Minneapolis-Fort uh, 
area, and it encompasses seven counties. So this is a giant one mosquito district to rule them all, if you will, um, <laughs> seven counties. Um, the third, I have Florida Keys. Florida Keys, uh, as people could imagine, there's a lot of uh, mosquito problems down there. But the thing that's interesting about Florida Keys is the Keys are islands. And so people don't really think about one district that has three different satellite buildings um, strewing all the way from the bottom of those islands all the way up into uh, the actual state of Florida. So that's, that's a pretty interesting district. Um, you can actually see here a, a picture of a helicopter. So uh, we'll be getting more into discussing what mosquito control uh, districts will be doing, but uh, they can range from very small activities to something like, you know, running helicopters to actually perform control activities. So it's pretty interesting. All right, so there are also a series of places, such as Tarrant County Public Health, uh, that is not a mosquito control district, but they actually perform activities. And there is a wide range of different knowledges behind that. I just gave some examples here. So like we're a public health department, animal control in a city, sometimes emergency management response, so like fire departments, uh, sheriff's departments. It all really depends on what the local uh, politics is. And so there's usually a very wide range of people, some of them not having entomological knowledge running you know, mosquito control activities. All right, so why would someone have or want a mosquito or vector control district? Um, and so a couple examples that are right here, uh, wetlands type areas. So that picture on the left, I believe, um, is kind of a brackish area. So there are mosquitoes that can actually breed in salt water. Uh, so those coastal regions that have all the salt water that's running into the fresh water that's um, uh, inland, uh, those are typically a lot of places with a lot of uh, problems. So like Aedes solicitans, Aedes um, tanyorhynchus are two mosquitoes that I can think of right off the top of my head that breed in brackish water and are extremely annoying. And so um, that either is gonna make residents complain. Um, so, so there's mosquito control districts in those areas. On the right hand side, you can obviously see that a swamp could potentially be some kind of problem area. I should point out here that if you have a healthy ecosystem and there's fish and dragonflies and things of that sort that, have, that are naturally predators of mosquitoes, you usually don't have a problem. However, when there's a drought portion of a season and you start getting isolated uh, pools, that's when you could really run into some trouble in, in a wetland type environment. All right, so the next slide, um, floods and agriculture. Again, we're talking about flood plains, but sometimes people don't think about emergency response. So let's say something like a hurricane rolls in and you get a whole bunch of emergency responders that are trying to go and, and rescue people. That is a place that's gonna probably need some kind of mosquito control activity or district. So um, for example, when Hurricane Harvey came in, they found that all these super annoying mosquitoes were just really impeding with that emergency response. And so that's a pretty good example of, of a floodplain or an area that's prone to some kind of natural disaster where they would need mosquito control. Um, agriculture on the right, um, some people may actually recognize what this is. That's actually rice paddies. Um, so throughout the United States, any place that has uh, rice paddies is going to need some kind of mosquito control. I could tell you right now, if I were to buy a house and it was greatly on sale because it's next to a rice paddy, it's because of the mosquito issues. So um, just keep that in mind if you're ever buying a house. Um, don't buy one that's near a rice paddy. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, what public health most focuses on is, is mosquito-borne diseases. And so um, just to read a couple at our office side, uh, most people are familiar with West Nile virus, um, you know, nationwide. Uh, you might be familiar with Eastern or Western equine encephalitis virus. Everyone knows about dog heartworm. But, of course, worldwide, malaria is a huge problem. And then, you know, you've heard a few others that pop up in the news, like chikungunya, dengue, uh, Zika. And so we'll be talking about those a little more specifically when we get talking about Tarrant County and what we do. All right, so how do these districts get resurrected? How do they exist? Either there's a petition from the residents, the residents recognize that there needs to be some kind of um, funding that's going to a mosquito control district so that they can have regular services. Um, but also it could just be kind of self-explanatory, like a judge or a commissioner's um, board of trustees, whatever, they see it as a necessary entity. 
Um, especially when there's disease outbreaks, that's when a lot of mosquito control activity starts popping up. Um, so usually, uh, for example, in Tarrant County or in Texas counties, um, there would be like a petition for 200 people, they want a mosquito control district, that's, then that is sent out for a general vote uh, among registered voters. Um, and so that could actually resurrect a district. I, I should also mention here, but a district can also be dissolved. Um, so if for some reason there is a tourist type community and that tourism happens to fall off and so you don't see a need for a mosquito control district that is already resurrected, then they can get rid of those. However, I will say that's not a very common occurrence. Once people start receiving some kind of um, mosquito treatment, they kind of want it for the rest of time. So um, that's a good thing for me, it's job security. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna to get to a little more of the, the fun part of this. I love talking about mosquito facts. And some of these you may have heard from uh, uh, some other presentations that have been given to y'all. Uh, there's over 3,000 mosquito, mosquito species worldwide, 176 in North America. Uh, that's kind of the recorded. We don't know if that's like 100%. Uh, but I will tell you of all those different mosquito species, what people don't realize is they all occupy different niches. And so some mosquitoes live in tree holes, some mosquitoes will live only in containers. Some mosquitoes will only breed wetlands, some like brackish water. Um, they may feed on different things at different times of day or night. So uh, a lot of people don't think about it. But you'll see, um, I'm going to skip ahead and go on that some species of mosquitoes only feed on reptile blood. Some only feed on amphibian blood. Some only feed on mammals. And so, I, I, you know, there's this misconception that a mosquito is a mosquito, but it's a very diverse group of creatures. Uh, only the female mosquito will take a blood meal. I know that this was on that, uh, that NASA presentation a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's actually true. The female mosquito actually needs that blood meal. Uh, the blood will be uh, translated basically into the protein of the uh, mosquito's eggs. Uh, so that's why it's the female mosquito that takes a blood meal. Males, they're pretty much only purpose sorry boys, is to um, mate and, and die. So <laughs> some species of mosquito don't actually take a blood meal. Believe it or not, we have a beneficial genus of mosquito. It's called Toxorhynchides. Uh, those larval mosquitoes will actually eat other larval mosquitoes. That could be very annoying. As, as adults, she will not take a blood meal, which I was very excited to learn when that came out. Uh, mosquitoes will actually find you through chemical cues, so they have antennae. They're looking for you. They'll find you from breath, so like you're, you're exhaling carbon dioxide. They'll follow that trail. Lactic acid, octanol, to name just a few. Uh, there probably is a series of other chemical cues or warmth that they actually follow. Um, mosquito, the word mosquito comes from Spanish for little fly. They're found on virtually every continent except for Antarctica. I'm just convinced that we haven't found any fossil evidence there yet because we don't explore enough. I'm sure that there has at one point in time been mosquitoes there, um, you know, annoying penguins or something of that sort. And some like to hibernate in the winter. And I say some like to hibernate in the winter because um, there are different methodologies that mosquitoes utilize to overwinter. They'll either overwinter as eggs, some will overwinter as adults, and those that overwinter as adults can hibernate. And so that being said, everyone says, oh, it's freezing outside, all these mosquitoes are going to die. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the case. So uh, they can actually produce what you put in your car, ethylene glycol. Uh, most of the chemical is, is glycerin, but uh, that prevents them from freezing, and they'll just kind of wake up in the, in the spring and go out and take blood meals and continue on the cycle. All right, so what do mosquito control or vector control districts do? Um, so a big one is disease surveillance, and so we have um, some example pictures here of someone performing a PCR at a North Texas Regional Laboratory that's at Tarrant County Public Health. In the middle, we have a picture of a gravid trap, which I'll be explaining a little later. Just know that we have to set traps out in the field to capture mosquitoes. And then also on the right-hand side is a, one of our staff actually putting mosquitoes into a tube to be um, sent down to North Texas Regional Lab. All right, so uh, mosquito control, that's another very obvious one. Um, I should say that mosquito control is also based on surveillance. We don't just, you know, go and put chemicals in a, in a body of water if there's no mosquitoes present. That's basically like 
throwing money away. You don't want to do that. So um, you kind of look and see how many mosquito larvae are around and then put, you know, chemical if it's needed. Uh, and then also I, I should point out that um, many mosquito and vector control districts, uh, along with people who are performing activities, follow something called integrated pest management. This means that we utilize every single tool that we have in the toolbox to try to avoid resistance. And also, um, we want what's best for the environment. So there is a lot of natural things that are used um, that we can just pull out of the ground. And uh, we know that it kills mosquitoes, so we concentrate it. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, on the top left-hand side, I have a picture of a buffalo turbine. This is something that's utilized to actually spray larvicide up and over fences in, in, in neighborhoods. Uh, they use it during the Zika response. In the middle, we actually have a fleet plane from Galveston. On the left-hand side, we have someone that's fogging a storm drain where some overwintering over adult mosquitoes might be. And on the right-hand side, a couple of my staff that are actually looking for mosquitoes in a roadside ditch. It's pretty nasty looking, actually. Um, we have resistance management. So just like when you're thinking about antibiotics and the overuse of antibiotics and how all these bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics, Mosquitoes can also become resistant to certain chemicals if they're utilized over and over and over and over again. And so one thing that um, we're trying to expand on nationwide is mosquito and vector control districts having the opportunity to be able to uh, perform these resistance bioassays, which is basically just a fancy way of saying we put chemical in a bottle, we put some mosquitoes in there, and we're seeing if they actually die. If they don't, we might have to switch our chemical class. Um, for adult control, there's only actually two classes, so this is a huge deal and we need to uh, pay attention to it. On the right-hand side, there is actually a picture, uh, fibrous materials, a coffee filter, and all those little black specks that you see are uh, mosquito eggs that have been laid. So uh, that's actually collecting eggs out in the field for resistance type studies, and so that's why that picture is up there. And of course, we do education and outreach. I put a bunch of uh, examples from, from Tarrant County Public Health. West Nile virus pamphlets, Zika virus pamphlets. We have a little door hanger there. It's got a catchy phrase. I like the mosquito stuff thing because it kind of gets people's attention. Kind of um, reminding people to wear um, EPA approved repellents and check their window screens. On the right hand side, we actually have something that we refer to as a backyard checklist. Um, that's every single time it rains, a homeowner can go out and, and do a, the checklist. Okay, when I dumped all my containers out, I checked my screens and, and things of that sort. And then behind there, we actually have created a few videos. Um, so we're just trying to educate people, homeowners, uh, about how they can take care of mosquitoes in their yard. Because this is not only a mosquito and vector control district job. Everyone should know about this because everyone contributes when they leave standing water sitting around. All right, and then of course there's research and development. So the CDC had put out $10 million worth of grants that were obtained by certain universities for this purpose. Um, the purpose of these um, regional kind of centers for excellence is what they're called, vector-borne diseases, is so that they can work with schools, local public health departments, um, to, to train people on how to do mosquito and vector control and also further the research that's going on, because we always are looking for new ways um, or alternative ways of treating mosquitoes. So um, I just have listed the five centers that are currently available. I, I believe they're seeking another one that's around the United States. So those are there, and as vector and mosquito and vector control districts, we work with those centers to help further along research. All right. I'm not going to read this slide, so don't worry. My purpose was to have a lot of uh, words on the slide so that people can get an idea of just how much goes into a mosquito and vector control district. Um, some of them don't have all of these portions. For example, not everyone has a lab. Not everyone has people to go out and treat. And so those might um, include, like, collaborators and contractors. But not everyone thinks of everything that goes into their, you know, the dissecting scopes people use to to um, identify mosquito species and all the beakers that are used to measure out pesticides. Uh, vehicles can include a fleet of planes as well as uh, ATVs and things where we can get in hard to reach areas with this mosquito control activity stuff. All right, so now I'm going to kind of switch gears. We're gonna take you through the eyes of Tarrant County Public Health. These are our uh, vector control activities. 
Um, and a lot of other local uh, municipal type areas will probably do something similar, the same thing. I know at Dallas County and, uh, and us, we talk a lot, and so we usually share ideas and go back and forth, and we have pretty similar response plans. All right, so first off, for those of you who don't know, Tarrant County, you may have never heard of, but Fort Worth, you probably have. So that is the county seat. We are in north central Texas. There's approximately two million people um, in the entire county. Uh, spread includes urban, suburban, and rural type areas. Uh, the ecoregion is cross timbers predominantly, so we have a lot of trees. There's also prairie land. It's, it's kind of diverse. Um, and we are Tarrant County Public Health that actually performs mosquito control activities in conjunction with our 41 municipalities. Um, so we are not actually a mosquito control district. And it's kind of interesting how these mosquito and vector control activities um, popped up. And so I'm going to go through a little timeline with you. Um, starting in 2002, there was some funding that was received by Tarrant County Public Health that was trickled down through the CDC and, and the state. Um, and basically, the CDC wanted to know where West Nile virus was traveling to. In 1999 is when West Nile virus got here. It arrived in the far northeast and then started uh, westward. And so in 2002 is when we actually started our surveillance activities. Below, uh, below that timeline uh, dot there, you can actually see a person, uh, Gary Rothbart was his name. He was actually sucking up mosquitoes from a storm drain with his mouth. Um, he's not actually eating them, don't worry. You just use your breath to get them into a container. Uh, so that's when everything kind of started. Uh, at that time, we were actually sending samples down to uh, Department of State Health Services, which is the Texas State Lab. In 2003, we kind of worked out an agreement with North Texas, North Texas Regional Laboratory. They're actually located at Tarrant County Public Health, but service 33 uh, counties within the area with laboratory services. Um, they kind of had a, a BT section, or they have a BT section that needs to upkeep their equipment. Part of that is PCR. And so we kind of worked out an agreement, say, hey, you need to keep your equipment up to date. Aside from just having PTs, you can run mosquito samples. And so we kind of worked that out. Um, we started using BTI predominantly, um, mosquito dunks, and, and putting them out, out into places. We started putting up static maps on our website so people could see where positive or, or mosquito samples that tested positive for West Nile virus showed up. Uh, 2004, they said, hey, we need to actually add this as a job duty. Uh, before that, it was kind of, you know, as needed or as they found time to do it. Then it became an actual sanitarian's job duty. So sanitarian, I'm talking about someone that actually worked with on-site sewage facilities as their normal job, part-time kind of did some vector surveillance. Um, kind of remained steady from 2004 onwards, except for in 2010 and 11. There was a lack of cases that were happening in the whole North Texas region. We just didn't see a whole lot of West Nile virus activity. It wasn't showing up the mosquitoes. In 2011, there was a great sample de decline in submission. So beforehand, we had about an average of 600. Um, in 2011, there was only 88 samples turned into the lab. Basically, cities weren't interested anymore. Everyone was like, oh, West Nile's gone. But in 2012, that proved to be incorrect. Um, multi multiple counties within the region, we had a giant um, West Nile virus epidemic. Uh, there was basically 1,500 cases. And so then they said, oh, wow, we, we, we definitely need some kind of mosquito and vector control activities after the CDC came down and assessed um, that there was a lack of that. Um, so in 2013, there was three dedicated positions to adjust mosquito and vector control. Uh, that's where I actually came in. So I started in 2013 because of this outbreak. Uh, that sample increased um, from, like I said, 600 down to 88, and then we went up to over 5,000 in, in uh, 2013, 2012. Of course, people started freaking out, and they had um, several hundred samples in the lab. So we had, basically had to increase a lot of capacity on environmental and the laboratory side. We also put in uh, aerial spray contract and started calculating our infection rates. That's MIR, but you see there, uh, VI actually stands for vector index. That's just basically infection rate and how many mosquitoes are out and about. All right, in 2015, we started a new database. Um, the picture that is below is you can actually access an interactive map on uh, during the season. Um, on the Tarrant County Public Health website, it actually will tell you where those positive and negative mosquito trap locations are on a weekly basis. We, uh, we update that with, with all the data that we get. 
We also started um, a plan to monitor for stegomyia. You're going to hear me say the word stegomyia. All that means is I'm referring to both Aedes aegypti and Albopictus, which are two species of mosquitoes that can carry some diseases, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but we started monitoring for them, so we bought a bunch of BG sentinel traps. In 2016, we actually dispersed those traps to the cities. Um, so we can actually have that stegomyia surveillance. We implemented um, new response plans for Zika because Zika became a very big thing. We added a negative 80 freezer, which is the picture on the right. That's to store things like dry ice and kill mosquitoes very quickly. 2017, we started receiving um, Zika grants, and so we were you know, able to buy extra items with these grants, um, and we also continued on those grants into 2018 and 19. All right. So our goals, we're not out to kill every single mosquito that we find in Tarrant County, because that would just be impossible. What we do want to do is to study and understand arthropod-borne uh, diseases. And so I should also mention here that murine typhus actually recently popped up. So this isn't only um, mosquito-borne illnesses, but there might be other bugs that can carry diseases, and we would also be interested in those. Uh, we want to survey for West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis virus in our Culex population. We also want to monitor where our Aedes aegypti and Albopictus mosquitoes are. We want to be able to assess the risk of people to mosquito-borne illness. Um, so that's predominantly through epidemiology. So our epidemiology division is very involved in a lot of these arboviral response plans and these kind of things. Uh, we also want to reduce the human exposure to mosquitoes through integrated pest management. That's where control comes in when you see, you know, a truck spraying, that kind of thing. We also want to discover where our regular and temporary mosquito breeding sources are so that we can treat them in the future. Um, and so let's say, for example, I want my people to record if they find a mosquito pool that's there because it's something temporary like uh, a fire hydrant that's malfunctioning or something, as opposed to a vernal pool that's going to re it's going to be there every single year in April. You, you already know you have to treat it in advance. Uh, we also want to educate our municipality people who are also going out and doing mosquito and vector control and our public about mosquitoes and the diseases that they carry. All right, so the number one concern of most people around the nation uh, with, with respect to mosquito-borne illnesses is West Nile virus. And so I'm going to talk about both West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis in the same breath, basically because they're carried by similar types of mosquitoes and they're similar viruses. Um, so they belong in the family Flaviviridae. They're a flavivirus. Um, there's something that's called the bird mosquito bird transmission cycle. So what this actually means, and as you can see on the right-hand portion of that little caption that's there, there is a green arrow that's going from a mosquito to a bird and vice versa. And uh, so the bird actually is, is, you can think of it like a sack of virus. It's a reservoir. It replicates the virus enough for a mosquito to pick it up and pass it on, usually to another bird. Incidentally, people and horses can also feel symptoms. That doesn't mean that other animals can't get West Nile virus. Your, your dog, your cat, they're, they're just not affected by the virus. Um, so people and horses, however, can get sick and they can be symptomatic, uh, which is why it's of, of a big concern. So it's a zoonotic disease. Um, people and horses are actually called dead ends. This is because they don't replicate the virus enough in their bloodstream for a mosquito to pick it up from them and pass it on to um, another creature. So that's why it's a bird mosquito bird transmission cycle. We can usually look for the virus and find out about it before it's going to show up in, in people and in horses. Um, so just to give you an idea of why that is, birds can actually replicate the virus many, many times more than people or horses. Uh, people or horses, they might have something like you know, somewhere in the tens of thousands of viral particles per milliliter of blood. Birds, hundreds of millions to billions, so many, many times more viral particles. Um, I should also point out that mainly what we're talking about here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is Culex clinky fasciatus. Um, it is fun to say after, after you look at it, I promise. Uh, we also have some other um, mosquitoes that have showed up positive, like uh, Culex restruens. Uh, Culex tarsalis is in the west. Uh, we have not found it to be carrying the virus in this area, but it could. We also have uh, Calyx niger palps. I did not put that on here, but we test for the presence of that virus uh, via PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. That's a real-time RT-PCR, a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. That's because uh, the, this flavivirus is actually an RNA virus, which is why they use that method. 
All right, so to know anything about West Nile virus, you should know a little bit about the, uh, the Culex life cycle. So Culex is a genus of mosquito, uh, and I'm just going to start by going through the picture on the right-hand side. That is an adult female. After she is mated with a male, she actually picks up a sperm packet and can continuously uh, fertilize her eggs. So she only really has to mate once, and then she can produce all the eggs throughout her lifetime that she'll need to. Um, what she'll do is she'll lay on the surface of stagnant water. She will lay a raft of eggs that are all stuck together. Uh, predominantly, there's 50 to 200 eggs. Those will uh, hatch in about 24 hours, maybe a little longer. Uh, and then you will have something called larvae. Those larvae go through four different instars or four life stages to where they will molt. They'll be, get bigger and bigger and bigger. They kind of look wormy and they're in the water. Um, then they will become something um, like a pupa. So you can think of a pupa as the in-between stage from uh, a caterpillar to a butterfly. They call that a chrysalis. This is a pupa. It's the same thing. This uh, larva is going through a lot of different changes. That pupa, uh, puparium or that shell will split open. The mosquito will step out on top of the water and it will dry. Um, I'm putting quotation marks as if you all can see it. <laughs> but they'll, uh, eventually the, the female will uh, females and males both will, will fly off and then mate, and then this whole process will happen all over again. I should say that from egg to emergence of adult mosquito typically takes around 10 days. That's also temperature dependent. So the colder it is, the longer it's going to take to happen. Uh, typically, the warmer it is, the shorter this, this is going to take to happen. I should point out that it can be too hot and too cold. So um, that should be said. So, Facts about the Culex mosquito in particular, they, they're mostly nocturnal, meaning that they're active at nighttime. That's when they're going out and seeking blood meals. Their flight range is pretty large. It's typically one to two miles, can be a little further. Um, they prefer organically laden water, so we're talking about if there's grass clippings in water and they're fermented, that's the type of water they really like, or even septic type water. Um, they overwinter as adult mosquitoes, so this is one of the mosquitoes they'll, they'll go and they'll seek out some kind of comfortable place, maybe an animal burrow or inside of a tree hole or in someone's basement, and they will kind of hibernate throughout the winter or they'll go through a stage of quiescence, which is not true hibernation, but just know that it's a lower metabolic rate. Um, they are mostly ornithophagous. That's just a fancy word for mostly bird eating. However, obviously, if West Nile virus can be um, handed down to people and horses, they also will incidentally eat off of people as well. West Nile virus um, and St. Louis encephalitis are, are similar in their symptomology. Uh, most of the symptoms will be very nonspecific and flu-like, so fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, rash. Um, a lot of people don't even know that they have West Nile virus when, when, they're, when they are exhibiting these symptoms. Um, and less common, and virtually about 1% of all people who experience symptoms, they're going to get a neuroinvasive form of the disease. That's stiff neck, stupor, Encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, myelitis, which is swelling of the brain stem or spinal cord, uh, meningitis, which is swelling of the meninges, all potentially really, really serious illness, uh, coma, and even death can result from this. Um, symptoms are only exhibited in about 20% of people who acquire that virus, meaning that 80% of people will never exhibit symptoms and don't know that they have it at all. Um, and West Nile virus seems to have replaced. St. Louis encephalitis virus. So if you go back in literature and you look, uh, 60s and 70s, you'll see a bunch of St. Louis encephalitis outbreaks. Just know that West Nile virus has kind of occupied that niche. That's not to say that St. Louis encephalitis virus can't mutate and, and then become a thing again. So just keep that in mind. All right, so for the surveillance of mosquitoes, we'll go out and we'll collect the mosquitoes. So that's actually a gravid trap. Um, that bin actually includes some water that we have made attractive for these Culex type mosquitoes, the stink water we call it because they like the septic gross water. Um, those mosquito females that are egg laden will try to land on the water to lay eggs and inside that black tube there will be a fan. The negative pressure from the fan actually draws the mosquitoes into the net. So that's how we get the mosquitoes. We come back, we kill them in our freezer, we identify them down to species. Um, just so you all know, there's a, we, I think we're up to 45 species of mosquito that's in Tarrant County. Um, we have to look for them in Culex. We also will uh, separate them, we'll put them into tubes, and we'll send them down to North, Te North Texas Regional Lab. So North Texas Regional Lab will actually perform the RT-PCR that includes making a homogenate or um, a mosquito milkshake, if you will. 
uh, they'll isolate the RNA since this is an RNA type virus and then we'll run that reverse trans transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. Uh, basically just a fancy way of saying, hey, uh, if the virus is here, it's going to replicate itself enough to where we can detect it. And that's exactly what happens. They report that to us. We report it back to our municipalities and our municipalities will actually perform response based on recommendations that we make. And there's also risk assessment there, so we are calculating a lot of different things um, and trying to relate that to human disease incidents. Uh, so we're just at the point now where we have enough robust data to really um, look into that. So that's what we're doing in the winter months. Responses to West Nile virus and St. Louis cephalitis. Uh, we say that if we find a positive pool, go ahead and, and treat for that. We do not treat um, in response to abundance. We are not a mosquito control district, so we're really looking for disease surveillance for that. If there's human positives, we recommend setting additional traps um, because sometimes those people are not going to get sick at their house. Now, it might happen a lot of the time because these mosquitoes are nocturnal, but these people could be at grandmother's house. They could be staying the night at someone else's house. They could, could be going out for, uh, I don't know, a dusk jog. Um, and so uh, we always recommend, especially because we also want to avoid the HIPAA thing, um, go ahead and set additional traps and then you can do your treatment in response to mosquito positives. Um, if there's multiple positives, we say elevate that response. Do it for multiple consecutive nights. And if there's an outbreak, we also have in place a contract for aerial adulticiding. Um, and so that did happen at least in Dallas County um, in, in the 2012 outbreak year. Um, and so we do have those uh, those things in place just in case we need to use them. Our municipalities, I have to point out here that we only make recommendations to them. It is up to them um, on what kind of mosquito response they want to do. Uh, a lot of them will contract with vendors. Uh, they don't have their own trucks and things of that sort. And so they'll call up someone like Vector Disease Control International or locally we have municipal mosquito and they will actually go out and do the treatment of the areas we recommend to treat. All right. Switching gears, um, we'll talk about the Zika virus, chikungunya virus, and dengue virus. These three are named together because they're carried by both Aedes aegypti and Albopictus mosquitoes, which I will refer to from here on out as Stegomyia. Um, both Zika and dengue virus are, are flaviviruses, um, so they're very related to West Nile virus. Uh, chikungunya is actually a, in the family Togaviridae, an alpha virus. The only difference that you really need to know about those two things is when I talked about West Nile virus only showing up in 20% of people, uh, the chikungunya will actually show up in 80% of people who acquire the virus. So you're going to have a big outcry if there's chikungunya because a lot more people are going to feel it. Um, this is a human, mosquito-human transmission cycle for all of these viruses. So it's not zoonotic. There's not any animals aside from um, uh, other primates that might be involved in this in, in the sylvatic areas. We do not actually test the mosquito for these viruses. These viruses are not here. We know that they could potentially uh, be here at some point in time if we have imported cases. Um, just like I said, the bird was, uh, quote, sack of virus. Uh, people in this instance are the sack of virus, which means that for a certain amount of time, about seven days after you start experiencing symptoms, those mosquitoes can bite you, pick it up, and eventually carry it on to another person after that X intrinsic incubation period or the period of time that a mosquito can become infected after feeding on someone who has one of these viruses. Um, so also, there's a big cost of resources when you're actually looking in the mosquitoes. We're, we're probably going to find it in a person first. Um, so it's not like we don't have the capability to test mosquitoes. The state, I know, does. Um, it's just not really it's not really needed here right now. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack, and then people start saying, oh, well, it's not in the mosquito. We don't need to treat anything. Well, that's not necessarily the case either. If there's a local case around and you don't find the, the one mosquito that has it, it's, it's, you still need to consider treatment. So North Texas Regional Laboratory actually tests the serum of blood of suspected uh, patients. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, Stegomyia life cycle, very similar to Culex. The only difference is these mosquitoes are actually not laying eggs on the surface of water. What they'll typically do is land above the surface of the water and they will take their back legs and they'll flip the eggs that are coming out of them uh, right above uh, the surface of the water and so they actually stick to the side of the container. Those eggs will then lie dormant until the next flood or rain event. 
Um, scary to say that some of these eggs can last a really long time, at least five years, um, probably even more than that. They also go through um, four instars as larvae or four, four life stages where they molt, become bigger. They'll do the pupa thing, and then they also emerge again, taking approximately 10 days, probably a little less or more if it's really cold. Um, they're a little different than Culex mosquitoes. This genus of mosquito uh, are mostly diurnal. Their flight range is very short. It's only 100 to 200 meters. I must point out here that I'm specifically referring to Stegomyia type mosquitoes. There are many, many 80s type mosquitoes, and some of those can actually uh, fly hundreds of miles. So um, I'm only talking about these two species here. Uh, they actually prefer human containers, and what I mean by human containers is anything that's man-made, like a cup, a, a bag, uh, even a cap that's coming off of um, a water bottle can actually uh, contain enough water to breed a mosquito. They overwinter as eggs as opposed to adults, and they're mo mostly anthropophagists, meaning that they prefer to feed on people. All right. Uh, Zika, chikungunya, and dengue viruses are all kind of similar to one another when it comes to symptomology. And so it's recommended by the CDC if you're going to, if you suspect one of these viruses, then test for all three because they're very similar. Um, in this table, uh, the pluses actually represent uh, how likely you are to get one of those symptoms. Symptoms are on the left hand side. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at fever, mostly that's going to show up in dengue. Uh, and chikungunya probably going to happen in Zika too, but it's most likely in those other two. A rash is most likely to show up in Zika, probably with chikungunya, not as likely in dengue. Zika is the only out of those three to have conjunctivitis, which is um, pink eye. Arthralgia, that's predominantly going to happen with chikungunya, although you can get pain, joint pain with, with Zika as well. Myalgia, which is muscle pain, is, is going to happen more with dengue. And then things like headache, hemorrhage, and shock are going to be more particular to dengue than they are the other two. All right. So Zika, keeping arthropod-borne diseases sexy. That's actually coined by an old associate director that we had, uh, which I thought was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant way to get people's attention. Now, what this is is Zika may be tra uh, transmitted sexually. This is the only arthropod-borne disease that's known to do this to this date. I'm sure we can discover more, but to this day, only, only Zika is known to do this. Um, so in 2016, uh, Dallas News actually came out and said, oh, the first sexually transmitted case ever is in Dallas County, and that's not actually the case. There was, a, there was a sexually transmitted case in 2008. It was a researcher. He went to the Zika forest, was studying Zika, came back, infected his wife. And this was months after he was there. Um, but she had the similar symptoms, was tested, and sure enough, she had Zika. So men can actually uh, harbor uh, Zika virus in their semen for, for six months, maybe greater. And so we do have an additional suggestion for those who are traveling. Uh, if they come back from a Zika-infected country, they might want to wear protection for at least six months with their partner so they're not passing it on. Um, and so in that, that right-hand picture there is uh, it's a little box that we actually bring to people. It has prophylactics in it, information about mosquitoes, uh, mosquito repellent, and that kind of thing. Um, and I like to crack the joke that there's only six prophylactics in there, so after you get this box, you can only have sex six times, which is not really the case, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so Zika and microcephaly, this is why the big concern about Zika came, uh, came to light. Uh, Zika not only has been linked to microcephaly, but it has been linked to some cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, there's also uh, congen congenital Zika syndrome. Not just microcephaly, there's actually a range of symptoms, uh, and if a pregnant woman is actually exposed to Zika virus during her pregnancy, uh, these ranges can actually take place, place. roughly 30% of those that are exposed while they're pregnant will have uh, a baby that's born with these uh, syndromes. So this could be microcephaly, which is an underdevelopment of the brain. It's a baby that's born with a smaller head. It could range from mild to severe. Um, of course, that does mean brain damage. It can be as little as some kind of visual defects, which is really the kind of on the mild side. To um, there, there have been cases where a baby has been born and their head actually caved in. As it's a horrible disease. It's just really not something you would ever want your child to have. Um, it can also 
uh, range with muscle tone restricts, restricts the body movement because it's different. There's joints that are limited movement or a club foot, things of that sort. And then incessant crying has been described in places where there's outbreaks. And they don't just mean, I mean, babies incessantly cry, but I'm talking 24-7. So um, it's, it's really intense. Uh, it was first noticed in Brazil in 2015. reason that is is because a lot of the outbreaks prior to the Brazil outbreak were uh, small isolated outbreaks. So they didn't have a subpopulation of pregnant women to actually study or babies that are being born that were exposed to Zika. Um, so uh, Zika has also been found in fetal related tissues such as the umbilical cord and, and the placenta and things of that sort. So that's how they kind of made the connection between the two. Stegomyia surveillance includes this BG sentinel trap. I talked a little bit about the gravid trap earlier that's particularly um, capturing Culex mosquitoes. This one actually uses a different um, attractant. It's uh, lactic acid with octanol and, and carbon dioxide. Basically, it smells like a gym bag. It's, it's terrible. It smells like a dirty person. And that's where we're actually capturing um, host-seeking mosquitoes as opposed to egg-laying mosquitoes. Uh, of course, when we, we get all these samples back, we still need to identify all the mosquitoes that are in that trap because there are other mosquitoes aside from the stegomyia that will show up there, and we report those to the city in hopes for um, kind of getting on top of if there's going to be um, an outbreak going on. So the resp response is a bit different than that of West Nile. West Nile virus, we have the truck-based um, ULV treatment going on. Imported cases, um, we, we have to break this up into imported cases and autochthonous or, or locally acquired cases. For imported cases, we want to find out where that patient has been and when are they still symptomatic. As I had mentioned, um, that person could potentially spread the virus on to a mosquito uh, seven days from being infected with the virus. That's what it's figured to be. Um, we also check out the patient home for mosquito breeding sources. We want to eliminate or treat them. Uh, we possibly set BG sentinel traps when needed. What I, what I mean by when needed, there can still be imported cases in the middle of January, but we aren't going to have mosquito activity going on. If there's mosquito activity, we definitely want to know what kind of mosquito activity uh, based on those BG sentinel traps. We also educate the patient, and we could potentially do a barrier treatment, which is where you kind of um, spray uh, plant life in the yard or places where the mosquitoes would like to hang out. They'll eventually die if they come in contact with it, kind of um, last for about 20 days or so. Or we could do fogging. Uh, it's a little more intense, a little more penetrative than it is, than is uh, ULV, which means ultra-low volume is the other method from the truck base. So just a little more intense. We also hand out those uh, care packages I talked about. For autochthonous or locally acquired cases, we're just going to basically do the same thing, but be a little more intense about it. We're going to not only do this for the patient in the nearby houses, we're going to go for an entire neighborhood. Um, epidemiology will be doing their thing. They'll probably go out and, and uh, investigate, um, ask you know, surveys of people and, and try to locate where the barriers of this Zika outbreak are. And that's going to help us determine uh, where we need to treat um, adults aside. We, we do potentially have um, aerial treatment coming in on this as well. Uh, Florida actually uh, did do some dibrome treatment from the air, and that turned out to be pretty effective for them. Um, so basically, we're just elevating that response. This is actually uh, a picture of where all of our traps are placed within Tarrant County. Um, there is a little bit that's encompassed outside of Tarrant County. Tarrant County would basically be the square portion of this. Um, so if you see a little bit that's outside, just know there are multiple counties, but all of these municipalities are within Tarrant County somehow. The green triangles actually represent uh, gravid traps, and the black squares represent where the BG Sentinel traps are placed. Again, I want to reiterate that these are municipalities, so like the city of Arlington, for example, or the city of Fort Worth, they actually go out, set the traps, they bring it to us for identification. They also are the ones that um, issue response. All right, so um, this slide I actually really like to um, reiterate again the difference between these types of mosquitoes, uh, 80s versus Culex. 80s, um, when I'm talking about 80s in this instance, I'm talking about Aegypti and Albopictus. They may be the carriers of dengue, chikungunya, zika, I did not mention, but also yellow fever. Um, they lay eggs on the surface of containers, not on the surface of water. They will survive the winter as eggs as opposed to adults with Culex. They mostly bite during the day or are di diurnal, whereas Culex are um, at nighttime. 
So again, issue those response at different times. That has to be taken into consideration. I also should mention here, um, during crepuscular hours, which means during dusk and dawn, every mosquito will feed on you. So that's why it's probably the most important time to go out and uh, wear those EPA-approved repellents. Uh, the 80s mosquitoes that I'm talking about are black and white stripes. They have stripes on their legs. They're pretty easy to pick out. They're very small. Culex are a little bigger. They're drab brown or gold. Um, there's not a whole lot to them. They don't have stripes or anything pretty. Um, and then the 80s will generally feed on ma mammals, and Culex will generally feed on birds. All right, so for ongoing and future activities, we do we are setting up a resistance lab so that we can actually uh, offer that service to our municipalities, check out, see if all their pesticides are still working as they should be. We calculate the vector index and the uh, minimum infection rate of our mosquitoes. We are in the process of relating that to human incidence of disease. We want to see if we can actually put together weather patterns and work on predictions um, for human uh, disease. We also do uh, egg collection studies, see if there's a better way to collect eggs than what we're doing now for resistance. We, uh, we're working on a larval identification database so we can actually say, okay, in this area, at this time of year, we found this type of mosquito. We also have a control activities database that we're working on. Um, so everyone who goes out and does any kind of application of any pesticide is, is in database. It's very easy when we get audited for us to bring that up. And of course, we are continuously and always doing community outreach. And I know that maybe people are um, a little little tired of me talking, so I'm going to actually uh, let y'all ask some questions. And I believe Sarah will go ahead and read them. Yeah, we've actually already got some great questions that have come in through the chat box. So please feel free to continue putting those in there. Um, you mentioned Nina talking about wearing uh, repellent, especially during dusk and dawn. We had a question um, that recommended insect repellent often has DEET, and maybe the DEET is bad for the environment. Is there information that you could tell us about insect repellents and their impact on the environment and public health? Sure. Um, as far as DEET is concerned, I don't think there's a really huge environmental concern, at least as far as harming wildlife. However, there are a lot of people who prefer different things. And so there's an entire list of EPA approved repellents. And so what I recommend is, what I would do is just go to Google, Google the EPA, go ahead and type repellents into their search, and they will give you um, alternatives to DEET. For those people who don't like to use DEET, I know that the oil of lemon eucalyptus is up there, and that's not an essential oil of lemon and an essential oil of eucalyptus. This is a particular plant called uh, lemon eucalyptus. The active ingredient is called methane diol that's in that plant. Um, and it's not, there's differences between essential oils and, and what this is. So keep that in mind. But it is uh, more preferred by the natural people, people who like natural repellents. Um, there's also permethrin, which is used to treat clothing. There is um, IR3535, which was rumored to be an active ingredient in uh, Skin So Soft, so people who've heard about that, um, it was incidentally kind of a, a nice scent that they were like, huh, this seems to kind of take care of mosquitoes. And as it turns out, they concentrated um, IR3535. That is the rumor. I'm not sure if that's a true story, but it's, I think it's a fun story. So um, <clears throat> my top recommendation would be just to go look for alternatives if, if you are concerned about DEET in the environment. I have not heard <clears throat> anything about that. Okay, great. And a related question is the impact of fogging on our health. Um, the person who asked, the community in which they lived, fogging was a common practice, but no one trusted it, especially because of the smell <clears throat> and things like that. And okay, so there's a number of things that go into that, especially because of the smell. That's telling me that they're probably using inorganophosphate. So first off, I, got, I have to say that there are two different classes of chemicals that can be used for adult mosquito control. Those two chemical classes are pyrethroids and organophosphates. Um, and I must point out here that mosquitoes are very, very, very small creatures. And so something that's utilized regularly is called ULV, or ultra low volume. Basically, we only want to kill the mosquitoes. I'm an entomologist too. I do not want to harm bees or any of that kind of wildlife. Um, so um, the pyrethroids, we're talking, and organophosphates, we're talking about six extra strength Tylenol spread out over an entire football field or one acre. 
So that's the way um, to visualize how little of that chemical that we're putting out. Matter of fact, what you're washing your dog with is probably a pyrethroid of some kind, many thousands of times more potent than what we're putting out in the environment. So please, I don't think that a lot of people realize that, so realize that since we're attacking such a small creature, we're targeting that small creature and we're not wanting to kill anything else. And we're also um, spraying around nighttime, so that's when your pollinators are in their hives, things of that sort. Um, and so, I mean, although it's true, there's pesticides, the goal is to kill something, we try to avoid killing not mosquitoes. Also, as far as environmentally, um, they've done studies that are around uh, places where sprayed and did not spray. And what they did, and this was um, through the CDC, uh, they went out and they actually looked at the metabolites in, in urine for folks, and they found that places with mosquito control versus places that didn't have mosquito control did not have a different amount of metabolites for those pesticides in the urine of the people around there. So that just shows you that it's really not enough to affect people um, and, and certainly not your animals. And so great way that helped. Help. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's so great to have such an expert on this topic. I think we have time for one more question. Um, we had someone ask about homemade mosquito traps. Could you say anything about why they do or don't work? Sure. And a homemade mosquito trap that you may be referring to is the one that you can make out of a two-liter bottle, and you flip it upside down, and you put some kind of yeast water in it. What you're actually doing is you're creating carbon dioxide. And yes, that will draw mosquitoes to it. And if the mosquitoes and here's, here's the kicker, if the mosquitoes get into that trap, they could potentially die. Um, but you're also triggering a long range kind of chemo reception that that mosquito, you're drawing in every mosquito from, from a mile away um, when you're doing that. So just keep that in mind. So if you have a large property, put it at the edge of your property, not next to your house you could potentially be drawing those mosquitoes in for a long distance and they'll find you before they get to the trap. So I hope that answers that question. That's great, great. Thank you so much for all of these answers and for all of your questions, everyone. I want to give a huge thank you to Nina for thank you presenting. For thank you. Um, and I'll ask everyone to hang around just a few more minutes as I uh, end the recording so we can do our final housekeeping.